Good afternoon and welcome to Illinois Extension's Commercial Ag Webinar Series. I'm Chelsea Harbach, your host for this webinar series. I'm a Commercial Ag Extension educator with the University of Illinois stationed at the Research Center outside of Monmouth, Illinois in the western part of the state. This series is held every second and fourth Wednesday of the month at 3 p.m. Be sure to follow our webpage for updates and details slash registration for future webinars. We ask that you save your questions for the end of the webinar or submit questions via the chat box throughout the webinar. Also, please be sure that your mics are muted and your video is off to assist with bandwidth during the webinar. You may use your mic at, to ask questions at the end if that is your preference. Today, I welcome my friend and colleague, Diane Pleva, Director of the University of Illinois Plant Clinic, as she helps me with this webinar to discuss the plant clinic and nematodes. Here's Diane. Hello, and welcome to this week's University of Illinois Extension Commercial Agriculture Webinar. My name is Diane Pleva, and I am the Director and Diagnostician at the University of Illinois Plant Clinic. And today I'm going to introduce you to the Plant Clinic and talk a little bit about the services we offer, and then Chelsea is going to talk in depth about the importance of nematodes to field crops and how to sample for a nematode assay. The University of Illinois Plant Clinic was established in 1974 as a part of Extension. We are housed on the Urbana campus and are integrated into the Department of Crop Sciences. We receive plant, soil, and insect samples for disease and pest identification. We work with university professors and Extension specialists on a wide variety of projects across the state revolving around protecting plant health. We are open year round and we receive a wide variety of plant samples, everything from oak trees to turf, to corn, beans, and wheat, to microgreens, to pansies. Our contact information is listed on this slide. Please note that due to the coronavirus pandemic, we are currently alternating sc staff schedules to reduce the number of people in the lab at any one time. So we may not be able to answer the phone, but we hope to be back to a more normal schedule in the next few weeks. If you call, please leave a message. Otherwise, emails are easier for us to reply to. So we are requesting that people contact us by email when possible. Our website includes information about our services, hours, location, and fees. You can pay for samples online using a credit card you, through our website, and you can download sample submission forms to be included with samples. So a little bit about us. We are the federally designated plant diagnostic laboratory for the state of Illinois. Most states have a single lab, while other states have multiple. Um, a few do not have their own lab. And in Illinois, there is one lab, and that is us. As part of that designation, we are a member of the National Plant Diagnostic Network, or NPDN. We work with a number of state and federal agencies, uh, mostly the Illinois Department of Agriculture, the USDA, and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. We work with these agencies to detect unusual or exotic or invasive pathogens and pests, and to develop management plans for those pests in Illinois. We also provide the phy phytosanitary testing needed for the Department of Agriculture to issue phytosanitary certificates for plant material to be shipped out of state or overseas. So if any of you produce crops that have to be certified, it's very likely that your plants end up in my lab. Because some of the work we do is for regulatory purposes, I've worked with six or seven state departments of agriculture over the past few years. We cooperate with other diagnostic labs across the country. That's probably not a huge surprise since what they're seeing on corn in Indiana or Iowa is probably pretty similar to what we're seeing on corn in Illinois at that time. But the NPDN increases access to different labs. So I've worked with diagnosticians in Idaho and Michigan and other states on samples or to discuss trends that we've started noticing. Our mission is diagnostics, training, and outreach. In terms of diagnostics, we process thousands of samples a year. We usually have several undergraduate or graduate students in the lab, especially during summer, and we train them in various diagnostic techniques. Um, both Chelsea and I actually worked at the plant clinic as students while at the University of Illinois. And outreach consists of presentations, fact sheets, sharing data, etc. In terms of who we serve, we work with a wide variety of clients. We work with a lot of commercial clients, um, and this includes field crop producers, nursery producers, and specialty crop growers. Other commercial clients include arborists, landscapers, garden centers, and other green professionals. Our commercial clients either use our diagnoses for their own field, or they use us as a service for their clients. Cropping systems also vary quite a bit, everything from traditional field crops to high tunnels and greenhouses to hydroponics and aquaponics to microplots. In terms of homeowners and private citizens, we get a fairly large number of samples submitted by people concerned about the tree in their front yard or the tomatoes in their vegetable garden. We work with researchers, professors, and students from the U of I, but also other universities, and our USDA APHIS permits allow us to accept samples from across the United States and all overseas territories. 
we provide a wide variety of services. Our main service is diagnostics, and in 2019, we diagnosed over 4,500 samples. We also provide research-based integrated pest management recommendations for addressing the pests and pathogens we identify, and we provide information via fact sheets, newsletters, presentations, etc. So this is a breakdown of the types of samples that we received in 2019. As you can see, approximately three quarters were agronomic samples with slightly over half of the samples being soil nematode samples. Um, this varies every year and this year was particularly high. Um, total agronomic samples are usually closer to two thirds, but last year we saw an increased uh, number of nematode samples, partially due to some large research projects we're involved with and partially because a few nematode labs in other states have closed. Horticultural samples, both commercial and homeowner, made up another large chunk of our samples. And this is a heat map showing the origin of samples submitted within Illinois in 2016, or 2019, excuse me. We received samples from 91 of the 102 counties in Illinois. And as you can see, the majority of those samples come from Northeastern Illinois and Central Illinois. We also received samples from 23 other states in 2019. Our services include pathogen, insect, and plant identification and management, nematode assays, palmer amaranth identification in mixed seed lots, and herbicide resistance testing in amarantha species. Palmer amaranth is a problematic weed which has been declared a noxious weed in several states, which means that to sell seed in those states, producers have to show that their seed was tested and found to be free of palmer amaranth. And we are one of a very few labs that provide this type of testing. Again, we do not issue phytosanitary certificates, but we will provide the results to the state departments of agriculture, which will then issue those certificates. We also have a molecular assay for detecting glyphosate and PPO inhibitor herbicide resistance in amaranthus species. Unfortunately, this assay only works for amaranthus and can only detect glyphosate and PPO inhibitor resistance. So this was a very popular service a few years ago, but as we've seen resistance become more and more common in Illinois, where we are receiving fewer and fewer samples, which makes sense since once resistance is confirmed in a field, we expect to see that continue. We are mostly self-supported, so we do charge for samples. Fees start at $18 for a general diagnosis and go up to $120 for a full nematode bioassay, but the two most common nematode assays for field producers are a soybean cyst nematode egg count, which is $25, and a corn vermiform assay, which is $45. When it comes to sampling, to a certain extent, the more the better. Ideally, entire plants are submitted because that way I can look at everything, including the roots, the stalk or the stems, the crown, and the leaves. Multiple plants can be submitted as one sample if they're from the same field or showing similar symptoms. Plants should be showing symptoms, but not completely dead. In many cases, pathogens feed on dying tissue, so they may no longer be present if a plant is entirely dead. We recommend that you dig plants out of the ground. Don't rip them up. Especially if we have a root rot going on, if you just tug the plants out of the ground, there's a good chance that most of the roots are going to remain in the ground, making it very difficult for us to examine them in the lab. We also ask that you wrap the roots and soil in a plastic bag or newspaper. This is both to keep the roots from drying out, um, and it also protects the above ground section of the plant from getting really dirty. If the stems and leaves are covered in dirt, that makes seeing symptoms a bit more difficult. And if we have to rinse the plants, there's a chance that we might wash away insects, for example. So it's great if the plants are, com are not completely covered in soil when they get to us. Um, plant samples can be shipped in a box or a padded mailer. We recommend using at least some sort of padding since those packages don't go through the rollers. Flat or unpadded envelopes are often sorted through rollers and that ends up squishing the plants and tends to make them arrive in a worse condition which complicates diagnosis. Please include a sample submission form. These are available on our website. There is a general diagnostic sample form, which is what you'd use for a plant sample. There are a lot of questions on the form, including things like soil type and percent organic matter. We just ask that you fill out as much information as you can. The most important things are your contact information, the symptoms you're seeing in the field, any patterns that you're seeing in the field, and if you suspect possible herbicide injury, what was applied this year and ideally last year. More information can be helpful, but it may not be necessary, and I don't want people getting overwhelmed with all the information we ask for. If you are submitting more than one sample, make sure you label the samples and include a sample submission form for each. If you are shipping the sample, please ship early in the week. We receive most packages from within Illinois in two to three days if shipped priority. So if you ship on a Monday or Tuesday, that means we should get it before the weekend. 
if you ship a sample on Thursday, we probably won't get it until the next week, which means it spent several days in a sorting facility, which may or may not be air conditioned, and that can cause problems if the samples get too hot. So again, we recommend shipping early in the week if possible. In terms of soil samples, some submission guidelines are going to be the same. Chelsea is going to go into detail about how to take soil samples, so I'm only lightly touching on it here. One very important thing to remember is that soil needs to come from the root zone, so several inches below the surface of the ground. If you just scrape a few cups of soil off the surface of the ground, you're not going to get an accurate idea of the nematode population in your field. As with the plant samples, we ask that you include a sample submission form. The nematology sample submission form is also located on our website. Make sure you include your contact information and check the service you are requesting. If you are submitting more than one sample, make sure you label the bags. Multiple samples can be submitted using a sim single sample form. However, if you're requesting more than one service, please use a separate form for those samples. So for example, if you're submitting three samples for SCN egg count and two samples for the corn vermiform assay, you can ship all of them together. However, please include one form for the three SCN samples with SCN egg count checked as the service required and a second form for the two corn samples with the corn vermiform assay checked as the service requested. Um, this help, uh, helps us keep track of the samples and makes sure that we are performing the right service on the right samples. The samples need to be kept cool. Ideally, they're taken close to when you'll be submitting them, but they can be kept in a refrigerator for several days. Do not freeze them and do not let them bake. A cold pack helps keep the samples cool during shipping, so that's a great thing to include if possible. And same as with the plant samples, we recommend shipping early in the week. This is just a general in overview of the types of diseases we tend to see throughout the year, probably not a surprise to most of you. In spring, we tend to see a lot of seedling blights and root rots, especially when we have cool temperatures and wet soil conditions. During the growing season, we usually see a lot of foliar diseases. Fungal pathogens are the most common, with gray leaf spot, physoderma brown spot, northern corn leaf blight, and common rust, the most commonly diagnosed corn diseases, and frog eye leaf spot, purple leaf blight or purple seed stain, septoria brown spot, and pod and stem blight, the most common soybean diagnoses in the past several years. Near the end of the season, we start to see more stock rots and seed or ear rots. Southern corn rust is always a concern if it shows up early in the season, so we tend to see a lot of corn rust samples where people want to differentiate between common and southern. Corn tar spot is a relatively new disease in Illinois, so we've been getting a number of, of samples of that as well. Uh, in soybeans, we always keep an eye out for soybean rust. We also get a number of requests to differentiate between sudden death syndrome and brown stem rot. The foliar symptoms are identical for these diseases, so it's critical that we get the entire above ground section of the plant in order to distinguish SDS versus BSR. We also tend to get a number of corn samples where people are concerned about Stewart's wilt versus Goss's wilt. Just a couple of quick notes about what we do not do. We don't do any type of pesticide residue testing. So the plant clinic does not perform testing to confirm the presence or identity of herbicides in plant tissue. What we do is we examine the sample to determine if pests or pathogens or cultural factors may have contributed to or are responsible for the symptomology displayed on the plants. And we issue a final report recording what was confirmed and or suspected as the cause of the symptoms on the sample. We will note if that symptomology uh, displayed is characteristic of contact with pesticides listed on the sample submission form. For a list of labs that do perform pesticide residue testing, you can contact us by email and we are happy to send you that list. We do not do any type of mycotoxin testing. We will identify ear and seed rots, but we are not able to test for the presence of mycotoxins in affected tissue. And we do not do any type of soil or plant nutrient testing. Again, we will note in the final report if the plants display symptoms characteristic of a nutrient deficiency, but we are not able to test for confirmation. There is a list of soil testing labs available on the Illinois Soil Testing Association website located at soiltesting.org. And we also have a list of labs that perform the tissue nutrient testing. So again, you can email us and we are happy to provide that list to you. And a final reminder, Dead plants are dead. In many cases, pathogens and pests may no longer be present. We get a number of samples after harvest where the clients are unhappy with their yield. I tend to call these soybean or corn autopsies. I'm more than willing to incubate and examine the plants to see what we can find, but probably we won't get the entire picture because these plants are dead and are often missing leaves or roots. So the best time to sample is during the corn or during the growing season when you start to notice a problem. 
And finally, I just want to assure you that we are open. Um, we're open year round and we've been able to stay open with some changes even during the pandemic. Currently, email is the best way to contact us and our email address is plantclinic at illinois.edu. You can call, but we may not be able to answer the phone depending on who is in the lab and what they're in the middle of. So please leave a message and we will try to return your call as soon as we can. Sample forms are available on our website and samples can be shipped as normal or if you're in or near Urbana, you can drop off samples in the big green bin outside the south doors of Turner Hall, just opposite the greenhouses. If you have any problems finding us or finding the bin, just email or call us and we will be happy to help you find your way. And now here's Chelsea to talk more about nematodes in field crops. Thank you, Diane. So I want to give you a brief intro to who I am and why I am here talking to you about nematodes in the plant clinic. As mentioned, I am Chelsea Harbach, a commercial ag extension educator with the University of Illinois. I actually interned with the U of I Plant Clinic in 2014 while working on my master's degree in crop sciences, and that's where I found my passion for diagnostics. I went on to earn my PhD at Iowa State University in Dr. Greg Tilka's lab, where I studied soybean systematode interactions with cover crops. It was in that lab that I gained my expertise in nematology, and I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about nematodes in your fields. Now, nematodes are a somewhat silent yield stealer. A lot of the time, you won't even see above ground symptoms of a nematode infestation, but you can observe areas of the field with lower yields on your yield monitor in which nematodes may be the culprit. However, in order to manage the problem, you need positive identification. And for that, you will need to sample for nematodes. I'll begin by briefly describing what plant parasitic nematodes are. Plant parasitic nematodes are microscopic roundworms that live in the soil and parasitize plants, reducing the overall vigor and productivity of the plants. It is estimated that Plant parasitic nem nematodes incur a global annual loss of 80 to $118 billion. And for the past two decades, the soybean cyst nematode has been the top yield suppressing pathogen of soybean in the United States. The last estimate on losses from corn nematodes estimates around $81 million annually. How do plant parasitic nematodes affect field crops to cause all of this yield suppression and economic loss? Using their tiny stylets or straw-like feeding parts, these nematodes can cause severe damage on root systems of plants. Take for example this picture here. On the left there is a corn plant grown in sterilized soil. On the right there is a corn plant grown in soil infested with stubby root nematode. The plant on the right has stunted roots and will thus be less efficient at water uptake, becoming more sensitive to water stress. Some nematodes, such as the soybean cyst nematode, create a highly specialized feeding structure within the plant roots. Within these feeding structures, the nematode manipulates the genetic material, synthesizing an environment that has a very high energy demand, or in other words, a photosynthetic sink. A root infested with many of these nematodes will have a lot of photosynthates that are diverted away from the grain, thereby reducing the overall yield. And then of course there is the surface damage that nematodes create by feeding on the exterior and interior of the roots. Such lesions can leave openings for opportunistic fungal infections. Pictured here is a corn root that has been severely impacted by the root lesion nematode. Understanding the problems that nematodes can cause on field crops is great, but how will you determine if you have a nematode problem? You can't just guess by looking at a field or symptoms. The only way to know for sure is to get out in the field and collect samples. Sampling and processing protocols will be different for corn and soybeans, so let's go through them separately. If you are going to sample for corn nematodes, timing will impact your success. Because corn nematodes are attracted to corn roots, if you suspect corn nematode problem, you will need to sample while corn is actively growing in the field. The best time to sample is when the corn plants are between V4 to V8. When it, corn is between V4 to V8, you can observe the field for areas that are symptomatic of a nematode problem. You can sample a cornfield at any time in the growing season, but it is easiest when corn is younger and you can identify and sample from those problem areas. 
The problem areas you are going to be looking for include patches of stunted or yellow corn, possibly corn that looks to be under drought stress. Think back to the effect that nematodes have on roots, and in some cases, stubby roots. Sampling from these specific areas will give you insight into the nematode problem present in your field. As far as proximity to the corn plant goes for sampling, you want to pull samples within the root zone because that's where the nematodes are actively feeding. Aim for two to six inches away from the base of the plant. Now you know when to sample and what areas of the field to sample, as well as proximity to the plant. But how will you collect the sample? You'll need a soil probe that is about one inch in diameter, pulling soil, soil cores that are six to eight inches deep at least. 20 of these cores will provide enough soil to assess in the plant clinic. You may want to bring along a screwdriver or a soil probe brush to help with any clogging of the soil probe as you collect samples. Collect these cores in a bucket as you go, combining all of the soil cores for the sample. Then you can pour the completed sample into a one gallon freezer baggie, making sure to label the bag so you know where it came from and the purpose of it. When submitting a soil sample to the plant clinic for a corn nematode assessment, you also have the option to send corn roots. Some plant parasitic nematodes may be present within the roots, actively parasitizing them. Submitting a corn root sample can provide a more complete picture of the nematode problem within the field. Shifting gears to talk about sampling for the soybean cyst nematode, or SCN. As mentioned, SCN is a top yield suppressing pathogen in the United States and has been for a long time. One of the tricky things about SCN is that you can have up to 30% yield loss before any above ground symptoms appear on the soybean plants. Despite that there are SCN resistant cultivars of soybean commercially available, the e efficacy of the available cultivars may be decreasing. This largely has to do with the diversity or lack thereof in sources of SCN resistance available in commercial cultivars. PI88788 dominates the market as far as SCN resistance goes. This largely has to do with the ease with which PI88788 resistance is bred into commercial cultivars. However, as we have seen with weeds and glyphosate, as well as corn, rootworm, and BT, Relying on a single source of genes for management of a pest can cause some issues. The figure presented here from a Carmel et al. shows SCN populations across Iowa are able to reproduce on varieties with PI88788 source of resistance at an increasing rate as the years go on. On the y-axis is reproductive factor, which is a method of measuring how much SCN reproduces in a growing season by contrasting the SCN population density at planting with the SCN population density at harvest. Any number above one indicates an increase in SCN population density from planting to harvest. And in this graph, you can see how many varieties had a high amount of SCN population density increase from 2001 to 2015. Soybean cyst nematode is, in essence, a sleeping giant in our soybean production systems in the Midwest. Determining what kind of SCM pressure is present in your fields can help you make smart decisions for management going forward. This starts with sampling for SCN. Sampling for SCN differs slightly from corn. For SCN, you want to collect 15 to 20 soil cores for every 20 acres, with cores reaching about 8 inches in, in depth. From there, you can combine the cores in your soil sampling bucket and then put them in a gallon-sized freezer baggie to be sent off to the plant clinic. Be strategic when thinking about sampling for soybean cyst nematode. Being a soil pathogen, SCN occurs in patches within the field, and some areas of the field can be more likely to have an SCN problem. Think about sampling towards the field entrance, separately from the back of the field, and consider sampling a hillside separately from a lower lying area. Additionally, if you know the pH distribution of your field, sample areas with higher pH separately from areas with lower pH. Of course, this isn't completely necessary, but it will provide you with the most comprehensive look at your SCN problem in your fields, which can give you the best foundation from which to develop an effective integrative pest management strategy. 
The soybean cyst nematode cysts are extracted from the soil for analysis in the plant clinic. And as these cysts are stable and do not move around in the field without intervention, sampling for SCM can happen at any point in the year. However, the best time to sample is either in the fall after harvest but prior to the soil freezing, or in the spring prior to planting when soil conditions are favorable. If you need or want to sample in the season, you should sample from within the root zone in patches of soybeans that are yellow and or stunted. However, remember that SCN can suppress up to 30% of yield before the soybean plant exhibits any above ground symptoms. So you have your sample or samples collected and are ready to send them off to the plant clinic. Following are details on how to send samples and what diagnosticians in the plant clinic do to get you answers about the nematodes in your fields. Here are some important guidelines to follow when preparing to handle, label, package, and ship your soil samples. It is important that your collected soil sample be kept in a cool and shaded place. The sample should be refrigerated if you cannot ship the sample the day you collect it. Remember, nematodes are living creatures, and in order to do accurate testing in the lab, they need to stay that way. Keeping samples out of the hot sun is key. Be sure when packaging your sample or samples that the bags are properly sealed and labeled with a unique identifier, such as the name or location of the field. Place the bag in a sturdy container with newspaper and or other insulating material to protect it from the heat. Again, be sure your sample or samples are labeled in a manner that both makes sense to you and is also reflected on the plant clinic form included with the sample and indicate whether the sample is intended for corn nematode testing or SCN testing. And finally, when shipping your sample to the plant clinic, time is of the essence. Thinking about the day of the week you are mailing and how fast the sample will arrive. If you can't overnight it, be sure you mail early in the week to avoid the samples sitting in a hot mail truck over the weekend or holiday. It might seem silly to go through these steps, but by ensuring that your samples are properly handled, packaged, labeled, and shipped, you are ensuring that the time and effort put into collecting the sample is not in vain. Samples that arrive at the plant clinic for corn nematode testing are processed using the Behrman funnel method, diagrammed here on the right. Without going into too many details, the process involves wetting a subsample of the soil, set up in a funnel, and the nematodes follow gravity and will migrate down to the bottom of the funnel. There they can be collected and observed under a microscope. Trained diagnosticians observe the nematodes and look for distinctive characteristics to identify the plant parasitic nematodes within each sample. Through this process, the nematodes can be identified to genus, quantified and reported. Pictured here is a lance nematode, a known corn parasitic nematode. When soil from SCN samples arrive in the plant clinic, diagnosticians can perform one or multiple tests depending on what the purpose of the sample is and what kind of information is needed. The most basic test is an SCN count, which estimates the SCN population density for the soil sample, and thus the area of the field from which the soil sample was collected. Pictured here are SCN cysts collected from a soil sample. These SCN cysts are crushed to release the eggs inside, and it is the eggs that are counted to, de to determine the population density. Here is what SCN eggs look like under the microscope. The other two tests can take a lot longer because they involve a soybean bioassay in the greenhouse. The HG type test will determine what SCN sources of resistance or indicator lines the SCN population from a soil sample can effectively reproduce on. This test use, uses all of the indicator lines and is most useful for research purposes. The SCN type test is a fragmented version of the HG type test that includes only PI88788 peaking, and cloud as indicators. This test is most useful for commercial growers because it tests the sources of resistance that are available in commercial cultivars. The information from the SCN type test can inform growers as to which cultivars they can grow to effectively manage SCN with host resistance. 
Pictured here is an example of what an SCN or HG type bioassay might look like. Using the soil from the submitted soil sample, diagnosticians will plant the SCN indicator lines for 30 days, which is long enough for SCN to undergo a single life cycle. So at the end of 30 days, females can be found on the soybean roots, like pictured here on the right. The mature SCN females are then sprayed off the roots of the soybean, collected and counted to determine how well the SCN population can reproduce on the different sources of resistance. As mentioned, this can be a very useful test to determine which type of SCN resistance could be most effective at managing an SCN problem in your field. There are some additional nematode services that the plant clinic can provide that I would like to mention here before we wrap up today. First is that the plant clinic can observe samples for export to determine if there are any regulated nematodes on the samples. This report can be useful in procuring phytosanitary documentation and is generally most useful for the stem and bold nematode, Ditylanchus, and inguina in wheat. The plant clinic can also diagnose other nematode problems, including those occurring on hosta, the foliar nematode, otherwise known as apolinchoides, and the pine wilt nematode, Recephalanchus xylophilus. The plant clinic diagnosticians can also identify nematodes from soil samples to trophic level, which could be an interesting metric used in soil, as a soil health bioindicator. And the very last thing I want to mention before we wrap up and take any questions is that Nathan Klachowski, our field crops extension pathologist in the Department of Crop Sciences, is conducting the third year of a corn nematode and SCN survey throughout the state. If you are interested in either of these surveys, be sure to reach out to Nathan at nathank at illinois.edu. With that, Diane and I would be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. All right, and before we move on to questions, as we have with past webinars in the Commercial Ag Webinar Series, we are going to take another moment for mental health. Have you ever talked with a therapist or tried to find one? What's the difference between types of providers and where should I go to find the right provider for me? Hi, I'm Courtney Cuthbertson and I'm an extension specialist with the University of Illinois. In today's Moment for Mental Health, we are going to talk about different types of mental health providers and how to find them. There are many types of mental health providers and it can be hard to know which one might be the right fit for you. The difference in types of mental health providers have to do with their training, credentials, sometimes their treatment options, as well as their perspectives about treatments. Let's talk about a few. So I'm going to talk about four types of mental health providers, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and licensed professional counselors. Let's start with psychiatrists. Psychiatrists are medical doctors, meaning they have gone to medical school and they have completed a residency training program in psychiatry. Psychiatrists can diagnose, manage, and treat mental illnesses and can prescribe medications. Psychiatrists may also order medical tests to rule out other health conditions. Psychologists usually have a doctorate degree and focus on evaluating and treating mental health issues through talk therapies primarily. In some states, including Illinois, if psychologists go through additional training, they might be able to prescribe medications. Psychologists may focus more on cognitive processes and behaviors. Licensed clinical social workers, or LCSWs, have at least a master's degree and may focus on emotional, behavioral, social, or psychological challenges that impact people. Social workers might also assist in finding additional resources. Licensed professional counsel counselors, or LPCs, also have a master's degree, and treatments focus on identifying goals and solutions, improving coping skills, and sometimes encouraging behavior change that supports mental well-being. You might see some folks with the title Licensed Clinical Professional Counselors, or LCPCs, which means that they might also play a role in supervising, in research, or in training others to be counselors. 
Any mental health provider may have certain areas that they specialize in. For instance, they might specialize in depression or anxiety or trauma or in working with adults or maybe in working with children. All of the types of providers that I've discussed today ha can diagnose and treat mental health issues, though the types of treatments that are available will differ. Many mental health providers work together in teams with other specialists, and all of the types of mental health providers described here are required to be licensed in the state of Illinois. There are several resources online that can help you to find a therapist. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA for short, has a treatment locator that can be found online at findtreatment.samhsa.gov findtreatment.samhsa.gov. And this can also be reached over the phone at 1-800-662-HELP. That is 1-800-662-4357. An additional resource is the website Psychology Today. They have a find a therapist search that will ask for your location and you can enter your state, your county, your city or town, or even your zip code and it will list options of providers in your area, including ones that offer teletherapy services that can be accessed online. The nice thing about the search through Psychology Today is that you can filter the results to be more specific. For example, you could filter the results based on your insurance, uh, what kind of issues you might like to talk about, or what kind of therapy you're interested in. You may also be able to access your insurance website to find out which providers are in network. If you don't have insurance, some providers will list other options on their websites. When you first meet with a therapist, you can ask them questions about their history as a mental health provider, as well as what kind of treatment options they offer. You could ask them what experience they have working with people from your community, whether that means a rural or maybe an urban community, the agricultural community, or something else. Please keep in mind that you are the best person to figure out whether that mental health provider is the right fit for you. And you might find that the first person you meet with doesn't feel like the right fit, and that's okay. It does not mean there's anything wrong with you. You can try again with a different provider. Think about it this way. If we went to see a doctor for a physical health issue and we didn't like or understand the first doctor's treatment plan or perspective or bedside manner, we would seek out a different doctor to help us to deal with the physical health issue. We can do the same thing when it comes to mental health care. And keep in mind, you don't have to wait for a problem of difficulty or crisis to start looking for and meeting with a therapist. Take a look at one of the resources discussed today and see if there's someone who might be a good fit for you. If you're already seeing a therapist, what advice would you have for someone who's trying to start therapy? I hope you join us next time for another Moment for Mental Health. All right, and without any questions on this webinar, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Be sure that you follow the QR code in the video or find the link in the description for an evaluation on this webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to contact Diane or I via email. Thank you for your interest and have a good day.